Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. I, I was in this room, I think, about four years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm currently in Canada, on, in Ontario, on um, some research and study leave based at Queen's and Kingston. Um, this is a place I love coming to. Um, I love, you know, sort of looking at comparisons, particularly between New Zealand and Canada and other countries as well, but Canada seems to be the one that I keep gravitating to. Um, so, um, I'll get stuck in. Sarah says there's a lot of slides, and there are, um, but hopefully uh, we'll just uh, stick to the, the really important stuff. What I'm going to do today is, is, is kind of try and answer Sarah's question about, well, um, you know, if primary care re reform is difficult for a number of reasons that are well rehearsed, which I'll go into in a moment in Canada. Um, what does it look like in a country where a lot of those uh, conditions are not present? And that's New Zealand. Um, so just a word of clarification on the title, Aotearoa is the Māori name for New Zealand. You might have heard the translation, the land of the, the long um, white cloud. Obviously, you say it in a different way, you could say it's the land of the wrong white crowd. <laughs> um, but uh, so, but but it gives you an introduction to the colonial context of, of New Zealand that that, uh, that we share with Canada, and that's important as we'll see as we go. Okay, um, and it is important, particularly in primary health care. Um, so, the way I've been coming to Canada for about fifteen years, reading a lot about Canada, and. The challenge over, overall in health um, policy, the way I've heard it described in lots of literature, goes something like this. You know, got the Canada Health Act, which most people are pretty happy with, um, most academics are pretty happy with in, in broad terms because it enshrines a universal system for medical care and no user fees. Um, and this was enshrined when fee-for-service was the dominant payment mechanism, so that's kind of been preserved in aspect to some degree, although there are, of course, lots of changes um, in Ontario and in other provinces around the edges. Um, but it also set in train what us political scientists uh, like to call a, a corporatist arrangement in which there is a, there is a relationship between the state, or you know, provincial governments, and uh, organised medicine, medical associations, where if, uh, so it's not just sort of the level of reimbursement that gets put on the table in those regular uh, meetings between government ministries and medical associations, but it's also any other ideas that are being kicked around in government. Um, so basically, um, new policy ideas uh, need to get the Im implicit or explicit assent of organised medical groups. Um, so what would a system look like if it was similar in many respects but didn't have that constraint? Well, welcome to New Zealand. Uh, a tax-based funding system. Our, um, at the national level, we look similar to a Canadian province in terms of the way the health care system is organised. Um, we don't use the word regionalisation, but we have something that you could call regionalisation. Um, and we have regional entities called district health boards that have the uh, primary responsibility for organising and uh, planning and um, funding services in uh, a geographical district. There are 20 of them. Uh, a difference to Ontario um, is that they have responsibility for funding um, primary care services as well. Uh, healthcare systems, a mix of pri uh, public and private. In broad terms, our hospitals are pretty much public entities and always have been public entities. It's, it's, um, it's pretty unambiguous, but in primary care and lots of other and community-based services, there's lots of private providers. Um, similar health policy agenda since 2000, perhaps before, so you can look at some of those things, but the, the buzzwords, integration, quality, efficiency, population health is, is, uh, is something that we've been trying to focus on for, for a long time. Uh, a broader idea of primary health care. Of course, Canada has been influential in, in, in defining what, what that means in many respects, Canadian um, researchers and academics. Um, broader uh, professional range in primary health care and a focus on 
different types of payment models has also been in the mix. Right, some important differences. Uh, we do have private insurance in New Zealand. It's nowhere near as extensive as our near neighbour Australia. Um, and it tends to be for things like elective surgery, uh, most often used for that. So it's mainly affects the hospital system, but it is there in the primary care system as well. And one reason why, uh, not a, um, is that uh, in New Zealand we have a significant co-pay for primary care and it amounts to about a quarter of all primary care funding. We know that now. We didn't know that until last week, what, the, what that actual figure was, but there's been a recent report that's come out that's been very helpful. Um, we have some unique arrangements which probably don't matter to our talk today. Uh, we have a, a no-fault full public accident insurance scheme, which also funds primary care, so it's worth mentioning in this context. We have a strong consolidated pharmaceutical purchaser, which is successful in, in keeping pharmaceutical prices down, um, and uh, at least prices for, for the government. And there are co-pays for pharmaceuticals, but they're $5 per prescription. Uh, and we have these things called primary health organisations, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about today. And they, they are what we might call intermediate primary care organisations. They are bigger than your family health teams or the various models that have been developed in um, Ontario. Now, Fiona and I like to talk about historical bargains in, in health policy. And if you've done and looked at the political science literature, you'll be familiar with that term. It's kind of, what is the, what is the broad sort of uh, original statement of the rules of the way the state and organised medicine relate to each other. And for us in New Zealand, it goes right back to 1938, when um, the government tr of the day tried to introduce a universal um, social security scheme across education, um, social, um, social services and health. Uh, but they uh, found part of it didn't get through, and that part was primary health care, or primary care, primary medical care, uh, because the New Zealand branch of the British Medical Association <coughs> resisted uh, the idea that governments would fully fund primary care. They wanted to retain the right to charge co-payments. And over time, the, the public and private share uh, sort of shifted in the private direction so that by about the turn of the millennium, it was about 50-50. We don't have precise figures on that, but I'm pretty sure that's, right. that's about the right figure. Um, here's an overview of the structure of the system. Um, we have the Minister, the Ministry, we haven't put Pharmac in this, but we have the ACC, the Accident Compensation Corporation, and the District Health Boards. 20 of them, see 20 with a population of 5 million, pretty similar to what Ontario is going for with 82, I think, Ontario health teams possibly, if they get that far. Um, so that sort of scale, average of about 200, 250,000 per district. Um, the District Health Boards own and manage the hospitals, the public hospitals, and then they contract and purchase services from non-government providers, including primary care. Um, so that makes for an interesting constellation. It's probably, it may not last that much longer because we're having a health and sis uh, disability system review at the moment, and lots of people have been critical of, of that arrangement uh, because it tends to favour hospitals, or it's one way in which hospitals um, uh, can you know, continue to, to uh, take the, um, uh, the lion's share of, of, of attention and, and funding in the, um, in the system, which can be problematic for people in primary care. For primary health care in particular, this is what it looks like. So uh, there are about 30 PHOs, and Greg Marshall did not, uh, asked me a few years ago to write a, uh, a, an article for our healthcare papers on regionalisation in New Zealand, and one of the key points in that article is, is about this this kind of interesting mismatch between the number of district health boards and primary health organisations. You might say, you know, what, why is that? And I can explain why it is at the moment. But the primary health organisations are mainly geographical, but not entirely. So we have a big one in Auckland, for example, that covers all different parts of Auckland, um, and it's not confined to a particular geographical space. Um, you can see that co-payments are there uh, for, for GPs and for pharmacists, and we could add for other things as well. Um, the funding flows I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. I, this came out in, in, in 
Uh, I first saw this last week. It's uh, an interim report of the Health and Disability System Review um, that's going to sort of uh, <coughs> uh, uh, come up with its final recommendations next March about what the health system should look like. So we are going through uh, turbulence and possibility of reform in New Zealand um, uh, as we speak. But have a look at that and you'll see that the, um, uh, you ha um, just look at the top on the right, that's general practice and PHO funding, you can see that uh, f GPs, our, our family doctors, are funded through uh, a variety of, of, of sources. Public sources uh, uh, predominate, but there are significant private sources as well, and that's mainly co-payments. Private insurance is a very small component. Um, so, but the, the condition that uh, New Zealand has that's different is the lack of a medical veto in, in health policy, and, and I'll explain our his, um, the consequences of our historical bargain. So, broadly speaking, New Zealand governments have much more latitude to redesign and reform primary health care or primary care, and they've done so. Um, medical interest groups are more fragmented, particularly in primary care, so there's a, a well-established uh, group representing secondary care specialists, and they are most interested in, in salaries and working conditions because they are employed in the public sector. Um, Whereas in uh, primary care, that, that interest representation has been much more fluid and groups have come and gone over the years. Um, and the policy process is much more pluralist, it's much more sort of unpredictable, but and, um, the state takes the, the lead a lot more as well. So there can be lots of different voices, you can't necessarily know in advance which, which sort of um, voices are going to, to be most powerful in the policy formulation process. Um, so, before I move on, is, it, is that um, just any questions or clarification about the New Zealand system? Because I'm going to talk now about primary care reform. Walter. Are all the GPs are PHOs? Ah, that's a good point. Um, pretty much all the GPs are part of PHOs. Um, and I'll explain what that mechanism looks like in a moment. Yeah. And to what, are they still predominantly fee for service? Your good question, and I will get to that, okay, because it's a very interesting detail. Yeah. Does the National Medical Association do uh, compensation negotiation for no. all? It's no. Still their dream no. In fact, the New Zealand Medical Association tends to be most active in debates such as uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, sort of broad things that affect uh, medical professions regarding whether they're primary or secondary. Okay. They don't get into the, the nitty gritty of, of, of that sort of stuff. That's the salary medical specialists that do okay. that. Um, Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Is there some form of accountability agreement or contract between the primary care organisations and the government around outputs? Another excellent question, which I'll, <coughs> I'll um, get to in the detail of this. So thank you, and uh, remind me if I don't answer it adequately. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the primary health care strategy, which was introduced in 2001 as a bit of a case study of what happens when you don't have <coughs> the medical veto. Um, a lot of these policy goals, I think, would be familiar to anyone broadly interested in primary care policy. Um, and we started talking about them in New Zealand in the late 1990s, really. So there's um, WHO's Alma Arta Declaration on Primary Health Care. Um, it's very influential. And Barbara Starfield's work was about what, what constitutes a strong primary care system. It was very influential. There was a strong motivation to address social determinants. The, the language of social determinants in New Zealand goes back to about 1998. Um, and as does the language of population health and thinking in terms of population health to about that time. And um, in New Zealand, um, Māori, our indigenous uh, people, make up about one-sixth of the population. So um, that means we are very attentive to inequities and disparities in, in access and in health outcomes. So that goes back quite a long way as well. Um, what sort of, what was the, the meat of the primary health care strategy? Well, the primary health organisations are, are the key component. They didn't exist before the primary health care strategy. Basically what the government said was, we'll, um, we'll uh, invent a new organisational type that you can join if you want to. So primary care practitioners, and they weren't just talking about GPs, they wanted a broader concept of primary care practitioners. 
um, including pharmacists, physios, um, nurses, occupa perhaps uh, uh, occupational therapists. Um, they wanted a, a much broader sort of uh, professional base, um, but they basically said, we'll put this out there, here are the conditions for being a PHO, you work it out amongst yourselves, who wants to be one? And as part of that, PHOs, the idea was that they'd be uh, paid through capitation um, per enrolled patient or for, for their enrolled population. That, that was weighted, but it's still a fairly crude weighting system. It's really only adjusted for rurality and for age. Um, is that rurality? Actually, I might, <laughs> might even be wrong about that, but it's very it's very basic system. Um, and, um, of course, there was a financial carrot in there as well because they would, uh, GPs themselves would be better reimbursed through this model. And uh, so the idea was that for the old fee-for-service reimbursement model to kind of wither on the vine, which it did very quickly. Um, so pretty much all our general practices, there's a few uh, you know, uh, GPs that stand outside the system because they can't be bothered with the bureaucracy, they would say, or something like that. But, um, but it's, it's 98, 99% pretty much. Um, so the funding flows through um, uh, a sort of national level contract which is administered at the district level. Um, so the bulk of the funding is for what's called first point of contact funding, that's capitation. So you, that tends to be you know, uh, funding that would support about 3.8 visits per patient per year. I think that's, that's about the figure on an average patient. Um, and there are some adjustments. Uh, there are um, some other bits and pieces added in. There's a flexible funding pool, that, which is a combination of three different streams that were later converged. One of those streams was originally about chronic care. Um, and... Uh, one was about services to improve, increase access for those that are not accessing primary care. Um, then there's been lots of bolt-ons as, as uh, we've gone along. Um, so there's additional targeted funding for PHOs that have high proportions of particular populations. And there's been a small pay for performance scheme added in 2005. Another important feature of uh, the primary health care strategy was the, the idea that primary health organisations had community governance, or at least an element of community governance. So boards of PHOs were meant to be 50% community representatives. Right. Now the policy process um, conforms to what I said earlier. So um, the process was, was very much within the Ministry of Health and led by the Minister at the time. Um, but it wasn't sort of based on huge, huge rounds of consultation. But the organisational form was based on what had been happening in the 1990s when a lot of contractual mechanisms were introduced into the health sector. So we had these large independent practitioner associations based in our urban centres pretty much. We had smaller union health centres which were NGOs but did a similar job to community health centres here in Ontario. And we had uh, specific Māori and Pacific-based um, providers that emerged in the 1990s. But, um, so whatever primary care interest groups there were, did they, they didn't have a lot of influence over the design. Here's, a, here's sort of some of the language from the document uh, that sort of speaks to some of the points I made about, you know, what, what was this strategy about. It's, the whole document is very aspirational and in many ways very imprecise about what it was aiming for. Um, but how was it supposed to work? Well, if capitation funding becomes dominant, so the theory goes, uh, providers will think more in population terms, so the theory goes. Um, also, there would be, you know, some of that additional funding could be used to support innovative uh, ways of providing services involving more uh, and different types of professions. And um, the other link to populations and local populations would be through this mechanism of community governance so that, that uh, communities could say, this is what is needed in primary health services in this area. Um, I, I guess the idea of PHOs that they could develop some services at scale, you know, outreach services, immunisation outreach services, for example, that, um, you know, that, that the member practices could sign up to. So the m basic mechanism is 
the individual primary care practices sign up to a particular PHO. They can only be part of one PHO, okay? And that's where their funding gets um, funneled through. Um, and there were some later developments. The, the use of contracts with DHBs became gradually more important. Um, the uh, government started to devise targets and uh, the pay for performance scheme sort of from about 2005 onwards. Um, similar sorts of things that I've seen that you know, were, are very much talked about here at the policy level. Um, and in the 2010s, there's been much more emphasis on collaborative relationships with district health boards to develop an integrated approach, pooling their resources to uh, identify health needs and to look at patterns of utilisation and, and try and jointly solve some problems. That's what I'm talking about later this afternoon, partly. Now, um, early in the process of the primary health care strategy, basically uh, more, many more uh, primary care practices signed up to PHOs than was ever envisaged. So pretty much everybody was in one, every general practitioner was in one by about 2005 and it started in, uh, implementation started in 2002. It was very much a let a thousand flowers bloom sort of process. You could be a PHO with 2,000 enrolled, or uh, the biggest one that I think at that time was probably about 600,000. Um, so, uh, and many pre-existing organisations simply became PHOs, or um, <coughs> there's a slight caveat to that which I'll get to later, but um, that's pretty much the overall picture. The four IPAs based in Auckland, Christchurch, Wellington and Hamilton, four of our five uh, largest cities, um, were the largest PHOs and they've been very important players over, over the years. And then around 2010, partly in response to a, a new Minister of Health and new government, uh, there was a bit of a shakeout. A lot of the smaller ones disappeared. There was lots of consolidation and mergers. And uh, the many of the smaller community-based and union-based uh, ones were, were absorbed into um, sort of mainstream PHOs, we, we could call them. Um, and lots of incremental policy adjustments, uh, which I won't go into unless you really want to ask me about them. But just to know that there's, there's lots of tinkering over the years. Um, this, very briefly, shows you the complexity of funding. There's basically four sorts of services of PHO funding, let alone ACC or out-of-pocket funding. So, and the mix is different uh, according to ethnicity. Um, if you have this sort of VLCA sort of component, the, the fees are capped at about 18 or $19 if you're enrolled in that sort of practice, which I actually am at the moment. Um, but you, if your fees are uncapped, you could be paying still 50 or $60 for a for a primary care consult. Um, so, what's the legacy nearly 20 years on? Well, this, is a, this year has been a year of reflection in the New Zealand health sector more generally. Um, and as I've mentioned, the report that's come out from the review of the health and disability sector. Um, some, basically, we've been tracking this through the health and dis um, the, the New Zealand Health Survey. We've been tracking, uh, the Commonwealth Fund has been tracking uh, the proportion of uh, people who say that um, cost is a barrier uh, access to healthcare. And the bad news is that, that that figure hasn't changed a hell of a lot over the years. Um, this is the first time we've used a, a, a patient experience survey uh, to try and track that, but the results are similar and the findings are very similar. So it tends to be about um, one in seven would say they can't visit a GP because of cost. And that seems to be a fairly 14, 15% and there are other cost barriers sort of mentioned as well and pharmaceuticals is, is one of them. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in Canada on, on enrolment um, or attachment of patients to providers and that figure has gone down in recent years. We were, uh, it was supposedly around up to 98% although I'm not sure the figures were reliable but now the official figure or at least that published in this report was 94% but then for one group of patients, the figure is 102%, so they must be overcounting somewhere. So we suspect it's around 92, actually. Um, so that's a lot of people that are not attached to PHOs, don't have a regular, you know, so not don't have access to that that stream of funding. So they would be paying some big 
primary care co-payments if they ever get to adult. Um, on broad population health outcomes, this is an older, uh, this is from a study done about five years ago, but this is, uh, and I won't go into it too much, it's just a, a, a classic, you know, we have five deprivation quintiles and we can see, you know, the top two lines, um, uh, the most, uh, the highest scores in socioeconomic um, uh, deprivation. And we can see a little but not much narrowing of the gap between uh, the, the bottom 40% and the top 60% if you like. But the, the, the narrowing between the, the, the bottom two quintiles is, is, is something that's quite intriguing there. Uh, that's for um, uh, um, avoidable hospitalisation for children under five. So uh, again, can you attribute this to primary health care strategy? You've got to be really careful. None of these things. It wasn't very specific about what outcomes it was meant to shift and so it's very difficult to sort of know which ones to assess it by. Uh, but a broad picture here for adults, 45 to 64 year olds on the same measure is not a lot of change over the years, which would indicate that whatever access problems were, were there in the 1990s are still present. So what's, what's the official verdict, or at least what's the verdict of, a num of this report that came out last week? Um, well, lots of, continued support for the framework and you know some bits of uh, success. So patches of innovative services and models are providing more integrated um, patient and uh, whānau, which is a Māori word for, for family, um, and culturally centred um, centred services. But uh, while there are examples of change that are making substantive difference, there's little evidence that innovation is, sh is shared or scaled. This is a familiar sort of story, I thought. Okay, uh, the funding model, interestingly, provides little incentive to adopt more innovative approaches, but the funding model is capitation. What's going on there? Well, maybe capitation doesn't do those things, but there's, there's something more interesting than that going on. And the primary care, uh, there, there was a big report uh, 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 that this is quoted from, uh, or um, that uh, we have a, a something called the Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal, which uh, Maori can hear grievances and have, um, uh, and uh, that report was particularly scathing on the performance of government in terms of primary health care. Um, so, while the primary health care strategy provided a strong foundation, it hasn't lived up to us. So that's the, the clear and consistent message, and we've been doing lots of interviews this year on another project around primary care, talking to, um, to national stakeholders and local stakeholders, and we hear the same thing over and over and over again. So, we have a policy with widespread support, doesn't face the classic Canadian constraints, or constraints that are, are present in a lot of other countries as well. So why has progress been so disappointing? Well. Now I want to talk about sort of three stories that you hear, three stories that are doing the rounds. And I think they're not mutually exclusive stories or explanations, and you can sort of piece them together. They all have slightly different emphases. So going back to an earlier question, this is this, um, the first story and the one that comes out most strongly in the interim um, uh, report from the review group was the unclear accountability story. So it's basically, when the system was designed, there wasn't enough specific requirements of what PHOs were and were not accountable for. <coughs> and that's true. Um, and there's lots of areas in which they, uh, accountability is inevitably shared between the primary health organisations and the district health boards. And it's not clear. So, for example, if you said, okay, if you want to do um, a health needs assessment, you need data about utilisation. Well, some of that data comes from primary care, which is traditionally viewed as private data, and some of it's public data. So, whose responsibility is it to put all this information together? It's not clear. Um, sometimes primary health organisation contracts have deliverables, but actually they're not that strongly related to the, the sort of broader vision of the primary health care strategy. They're kind of things devised by mid-level bureaucrats rather than sort of the, the top-level policy wonks. Um, but even when they are there, they are kind of <coughs> seem to be optional. Um, a good example was um, uh, 
uh, provision for after hours or what do you call it here, you know, sort of you know, evening care and primary care on evenings and weekends. What the government thought it was getting was, um, you know, 24 hour, seven day a week coverage. So the, the idea that the primary care practices would roster people through, you know, through PHOs, they'd, they, they'd come up with some sort of rostering arrangement. In a lot of parts of the country that simply did not happen. And then the government had to shell out some more money to sort of do um, specifically uh, sponsor more uh, after hours initiatives. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of, you know, unclear accountability or accountability that's there in, in, in um, theory but not in practice. And that links somewhat to the second story, which is the leadership failure story, and there's, there's certainly some truth in that. Um, I've long argue, argued in New Zealand we have a strong uh, legacy of new public management in, in, in New Zealand, for better and for worse. And one of the worst aspects of it is uh, that back in the 90s, there was this ethic that policy or ministries were not responsible for implementation. So they didn't even think about implementation, and they've never been good at thinking about implementation. Um, and that's not, that's not unique to health, but it's particularly problematic in health. Um, so, you know, bring in the primary health care strategy, move on to something else. Um, and the DHBs were relatively new, and they didn't necessarily have the wherewithal to sort of, you know, they tried a lot of things, but a lot of them weren't, weren't necessarily successful in the early years. So, for example, I remember district health boards would, would say things like, well, uh, we only want two primary health organisations in our district, and they ended up with seven. They you know, couldn't actually influence it. Um, so, and there was quite a bit of leadership turnover, loss of institutional memory. The health system has just been restructured, but there wasn't a lot of communication between those driving um, the broader health system reforms and the primary health care reforms in the ministry. And Robin Gould, my colleague from uh, University of Otago, has, has written extensively on that in a great paper. Came out quite a long time ago now, but it's a, it's a very good case study. Um, and thirdly, there's what you might call the subversion story, that, that primary care doctors in particular um, subverted the primary health care strategy. They um, dodged and ducked and weaved. Um, one, and there's some evidence for that. Um, one particularly thing that's, that's galling for a lot of people is that, that um, as a legal entity, PHOs are meant to be uh, non-government, non-profit entities, subject to that sort of um, uh, legislation. Yet what happened in a, in a, a couple of cases, and this covers a lot of the population of PHOs, so two of the bigger ones, is they basically created shell organisations. So the, the PHO exists, but it doesn't employ anyone. The money flows through it, but the, all the management and all the employment and the board and the governance is all done uh, in, in the pre-existing organisation. And they got away with that. Um, so we've talked about disputing or not honouring some contractual requirements. So one one thing there was to talk about the community governance thing. If you actually, if you have a nominal organisation that doesn't doesn't actually do anything, then doesn't matter who you put on the board if the power is elsewhere. Um, and the other sort of thing that's been noted is, is is passing on flexible funding straight to the primary care doctors rather than using it to um, try and support some sort of more innovative services. So just you know, using it to to prop up um, primary care practices. Um, so in the large PHOs in particular tend to want to do their own thing. Um, they may be interested in what, what, what noises are coming out of the ministry, but they also tend, you know, one or two of them in particular tend to sort of be very uh, dismissive of the signals that they get from the ministry on, on a lot of things. So we can put those things together, but I'm, as a political scientist, I, th I think this is one of those areas where what we might call broadly a structural approach can work and has something to say. And we've got to think about the, the nature of how primary care doctors make a living. Okay? And I'm sure people are thinking about that in Ontario all the time. Um, but what sort of things are family doctors interested in? They're interested in control over workload, they're interested in autonomy over practice. That, you know, that's that's feeds into the sort of some of the interprofessional issues. And um, most 
significantly, and the thing you hear, hear most is the continued viability of this for-profit small business model, even though it's sort of being chipped away at from all sorts of angles. Um, there's more corporate um, organisations buying up GP practices in New Zealand at the moment, for example, but still by far the predominant model. Now, one of the things about the PHO structure is because uh, is that any primary care practice can choose which PHO it belongs to. When you've got more than one PHO in an area, um, one uh, th there is a Maori PHO, and I've talked to a guy from the Maori PHO who says, you know, what he sees happening is there's a race to the bottom. So that if one PHO passes on uh, all its its flexible funding to the constituent practices, then the by nature of the competitive element, you know, um, if they want to, uh, if others want to hang on to their GPs and not have them go defect to the other one, then they will do the same thing. So doctors can shop around between PHOs, and so therefore PHOs are, are you know, worried about, you know, kind of what affects their their constituency, which they probably should be. Um, but the broader question is, how does a government get primary care doctors to uh, to do things? differently in, in the service of some of these broader primary, uh, primary care objectives. Because we know primary care doctors are usually very interested in quality, or can be very interested in quality, uh, integration, those things are not, not too difficult, but things like population health, efficiency, um, access, those you know, are not things that uh, primary care doctors necessarily are, are trained to think about or inclined to think about in, in many situations. So, let's go to a very tried and true, but I think useful typology of, type, uh, of policy instruments. You can use sticks, you can use carrots, or something else that's a bit sort of uh, based on persuasion and understanding and collaboration. So, command and control, that's, all these things have been used, is basically the point of this slide. In, um, contracts and legislative re requirements, they're all, you can find these. You can, uh, we've seen financial incentives, and we've also seen more recently stim uh, stimulation of ho local homegrown collaborative arrangements. Now, basically we're looking at what happens at implementation. Doesn't matter what, which of these instruments you use, they can all be, I think, effectively, um, what's the word, resistant, it isn't quite the word I'm looking for, but they can all be channelled by primary care doctors uh, in ways that, you know, sort of uh, uh, are less threatening or, or um, you know, uh, uh, consistent with their interests. So, um, generally, if, if there's overt command and control through contracts, they are successfully resisted. I, um, I, knew, I mean. You see this on a much larger scale with Quebec in recent years with the requirement to, to, for Quebec to enrol, uh, Quebec medical practitioners or primary care practitioners to enrol a certain proportion. The minister said, you know, do this or else you will have your income cut. Of course, none of that happened. Um, so, smaller examples in New Zealand, basically. Now, I can talk more about that, but I just sort of want to raise that. It doesn't matter which policy instrument is used, they all come, uh, you know, face the reality of medical professional power in primary care. Um, so, what can be done? I mean, as a political scientist, I'm saying, saying that, you know, you might think it's a good thing, you might think it's a bad thing, but, you know, it's simply trying to describe what the situation is. So if that is the situation, then what, if anything, can be done? Now, a structural account, you know, where people do things because of their economic interests, basically, or professional interests, is really only par part of the story. It doesn't answer a lot of other questions, which is, well, how do people perceive their interests in the first place? And this is where I wanted to talk about that, that, that interesting issue of capitation. So overall, Two-thirds of a GP's income comes from capitation, yet capitation appears to have no influence on the behaviour of what GPs do. Fee-for-service dominates the way that they try to maintain their business, maximise their income, okay? Getting more patients through the door. Not 
trying to find people who are not enrolled and get them enrolled. And partly that's because it's got to do, I guess, with their skill sets. You know, nobody uh, haven't been trained to find unattached patients, so how the hell do they start doing it? When, you know, they, they've got a, um, uh, yeah, so, so that is, I think, an interesting insight in the fact that how primary care doctors in New Zealand see their interests might not actually reflect what their interests are. Um, of course, capitation is fairly crude. It still would encourage, in its current form, would encourage cream skimming. Um, so it's, uh, but it, it could be, the formulas could be adjusted. But basically, none of that really matters at the moment because they don't respond to those incentives. Um, so, so I, I suggest the way forward, or part of the way forward, certainly not the whole way forward, is thinking about how to harness or think about ways that primary care doctors can be encouraged to think about their interests differently. And that's probably got to be led from within the profession. Um, and I know of a leader in New Zealand that, that's spending a lot of time trying to do that. Um, there's, there's probably yeah, many more than one. Um, we can see this sort of starting to happen in quality agenda, integration agenda. Um, the challenge is for that to be expanded to, in, in terms of population health. And, it's, and to be fair, the, the, um, uh, the, I think the, one of the, the medical interest groups in its submission, I think it was the NZMA, uh, to the, the review, did talk about the importance of addressing inequities. And it was very much sort of as if it was written as a, as a public health, Masters of Public Health essay <laughs> about structural um, barriers to, to primary health in primary health care. So, um, so there may be some indications of, of, of a shift, but I think we've got a long way to go. Meanwhile, what we're seeing in New Zealand is this re-emphasis in the report that came out last week on enforceability and accountability and sticks. So this is going to be very interesting to watch. So I think key to shaping perception of interests is around um, the workload issue. I think that's where uh, policy makers and, uh, can have the most sort of success in sort of perceptions around workload, at least that's a very strong uh, story in New Zealand at the moment. Um, so that's pretty much where I wanted to sort of end the presentation, but also very happy to provide clarification and answer your, your questions about, particularly in relation to what's happening in Ontario at the moment. So thank you.